that was a conceit. <laughs> but it was fun. And it, it was printed in some little venue. But yeah, don't. it's a cute idea, but there was no story there. But I thought it was a cute image. Mm -hmm. One thing to do to make sure that you have a story and not just an event is to make sure that you have both an internal and an external conflict. So there might be the external conflict, which is solving the mystery or jumping off an asteroid or whatever <laughs> that you mentioned yesterday. Um, or, but there has to be an internal conflict as well, usually with your protagonist. They have to grow in the story. They have to overcome a fear or they have to resolve something. There has to be some growth in the character art that is internal, that is directly related to the story that you're writing. And the other thing to do is also make sure, not make sure, it's possible you guys have written hundreds, read hundreds of these short stories, but for those of us who are kind of just starting, keep to one central plot. Don't worry about subplots. Not the short stories. Concentrate on the plot of the story. You can throw in a couple of red herrings if it's a mystery or whatever, or um, a couple of characters that could have done the murder or whatever that is, but keep the subplots out. Keep it simple. Just tell the story that you're trying to tell, and that should hopefully help the pacing. Yeah, I totally agree with having the inner turmoil, which is interesting because that's an extremely modern idea. If you read a lot of older fiction, it's just not there. And yet, if you want to sell your stuff today, it's far better to have it there than not. Yeah, inner turmoil, inner turmoil might be emotional, it might be intellectual questioning. My story was nominated for the Sideways Award. Great White Ship is about a, a ship that comes, a, a dirigible from an alternate reality that comes to uh, East Texas Airport in a storm. And many years later, man's telling the story of this airship that came in, and then the whole thing episode was hushed, hushed up. Now, you know the protagonist is the person the story is being told to. He's not quite sure to believe the story. But, you know, he lets the old man tell him the tale. And then later, the reason why he was in the airport and he had time to kill was he was waiting on his American Airlines flight. The dirigible that came in from the alternate reality was an American Airlines LTA craft. When he finally gets his plane, he gets on the plane, and he sees the name badge of the pilot, and it's the same name as the man in the story that was told to him, and he realizes, this is the guy, it's 30 years later, but this is the man in our reality. And he realizes the story's true. There is a pilot named Will Banks, and he, and he accosts him before the flight takes off, and he says, uh, did, you ever, did you ever in your dreams have dreams about piloting a great white airship? And the man looks him in the eyes and goes, who are you to know my innermost dreams? I've never even said that to my wife. <laughs> he says, when you put Jen on autopilot, come back here, I want to tell you a story. So his inner conflict, he didn't know whether to believe the story mm -hmm. he was told, and the story ends in a very satisfying way. The man is confirmed <laughs> to the man, and then it just tells him, come back here, I want to tell you a story. Which also strikes me as the way all stories should end. You know, I'm telling mm -hmm. you a story. So the guys, the, the point was, is, is his inner turmoil, whether to believe this, or was it a crazy story, it's resolved for both the, the narrator and for you. You know that the story, for what it is, is true. Oh, do we have any questions from the audience? We have a nice crowd here. Yes? Yeah. Um, any idea of like um, a sweet spot for time period that a short story would take place in, whether it's like a scene or a couple of days, is there too much time that it's just too much to handle? Or <laughs> It depends on your market, it depends what okay. you're trying to do. Like When I first opened Fantastic Stories, I love longer stories. I like to see some development. I like 10 to 20,000 words. But it turns out our audience wasn't reading those stories. You know, I had these great stories from some major names and it get five it, people would read through it. And then I'd have a thousand word story that I purchased and 3,000 people read it. So, I think we're going to stop buying longer stuff for the web because nobody's reading it. So if you're trying to, to send to a web thing, I'd say under 3,000. Personally, I think the best short stories can be between three and five. I know I like longer, but, but I think three to five is a really nice way. Uh, you can get a whole story in there. You can do a little bit of character development. And it's a hell of a lot easier to sell than five to 10, mm -hmm. especially if you're a new author. I think she might mean how much time is elapsing in the story. Yeah, the chronology of the story. Yeah. yeah, just like how much is there a sweet spot? No, I, not that there can't be a really short scene or you know a no. really long time period, but no, I mean I see I see stories that take 
one scene and that's it, and then other stories that have 15 or 20 scenes in just 2,000 words. You know, it just depends on yeah. if the author can pull um, it off. Unless you're Olaf Stapleton, you know, it's hard to pull <laughs> off, you know, scene one, one million years A.D., scene two, ten billion years later. <laughs> you definitely don't pull that off. One of the virtues I find with telling a story in a flashback is it pulls the, uh, pulls the reader into thinking, not getting bored with the time, because strictly speaking, a flashback could be considered contemporaneous, as like I say, you know, the, the story I just mentioned, Great White Ship, actually, you, you know, you can see it happening in real time, because this, this guy's in an airport and a man tells him a story. Then he gets on his plane and the story ends. The, the, the flashback goes back 30 years, so you don't think of it as being in the time. The flashback can be very economical that way, but I mean, you can do stories over extended periods of time. People do stories with generations, multi-generations. Um, People can do, uh, uh, part of our view towards that is skewed because movies have a way of compressing time and playing with time. In fact, it's very unusual for a movie to be set in real time. And uh, if it's done well, you don't notice it. You know, hardly anybody ever notices that that famous Western, High Noon, is set in real time. It starts at 10 o'clock and it ends at high noon. Uh, you don't even think about that. But generally, you know, the movies and... Uh, of course, one thing you can do in a motion picture you can't do in a book is like you can visually show a character aging. And in a book, that's a lot more difficult to indicate the passage of time that way. So it really depends on the story you're telling. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can have a really good story that is set in, in uh, you know, who, who somebody said in another panel, you say the best place to start a story is one second before the conclusion? That was the, Rob, was that his name? Yes, he, he did say that several yeah. times. Yeah. Best so, time to start a story is the moment before how it's going to end. So you start it, and then you flash back and give all the background, and then you end it. You know, Rogers Lasley said that his best stories were always the last chapters of a novel that he didn't bother to write. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just wrote the last chapter. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, are there any uh, plotting tropes? Uh, we're putting all flashbacks a lot. And uh, I, I've worried sometimes I use flashbacks occasionally and some, some film will, some haven't. Are there any plotting tropes that you just say Ugh, that don't work well for you, that, that, that kind of are kind of a death knell for a story? Um, there's a lot to do with the author and the skill. Present tense is usually a plot killer. Okay. But you know, I see a t I hate present tense, and I see a ton of it mm -hmm. now because of the Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I even, I'm even finding myself buying some of it. I'm being beaten to death. <laughs> and back in the day, it would be like two or three percent of the stories. Now it's thirty percent of what I get is in the present tense, and I'm just like, are you walking around with a tape recorder for Christ's sake? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> probably what it. Uh, Dragon. Right. But, you know, because the Hunger Games are huge and they, have, they seem to really be influencing the authors, I'm, I'm getting a lot of that. And if the writer's good enough, I'm actually buying it despite the fact that I don't like it mm -hmm. as a tense. Is the Hunger Games written in the first person mm -hmm. tense? Yes. Say I've never read it. Wow. Boy, as a journalist, that real, I find that almost, I can't even make sure I can understand that. <laughs> I'm sitting at the city council meeting and the mayor bangs the gavel. Is that what you did? Yeah. 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 It worked for the first book, not so well for the second and third. Yeah. The uh, other things, you know, you, you might want to avoid is like, don't if you have a consistent point of view. If you shift a point of view, be careful to make sure you know it's obvious you shifted the point of view. Some authors say always shift a point of view by uh, chapter by chapter, which you don't do in a you short do a story. Break. You don't Seems need a chapter. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I'll, I'll tell you that this, I, I always kind of, I shouldn't say this. I had the damnedest time in high school and college trying to focus on the character's writing. And then I remember I finally got it. I'm like, okay, now I know how to move from head to head. And then I read The Sword of Sean Rogg and I realized why I couldn't fucking focus on a character. And I kept bouncing around badly because I was copying that book. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, one issue, at least. I've faced, I don't know if anyone else has, is that when writing a short story, sometimes, or okay, a lot of the time, <laughs> I'll run over the short story boundary thinking, huh, you know, if I flesh this out, I flesh this out, I flesh this out, you know, if we get a short story, I've got a novel here. <laughs> How do you keep that in check and make sure you trim the hedges and make sure it stays a nice short story as opposed to running off into a novel? I've, I, I hear people say that, but I've never had that problem. It's never, ever happened to me. Well, I, the, the main thing is to 
a piece of advice I once heard is a short story is where you tell a story. Uh, something longer like a novella, you can you can do some character development.